for anyone who wants to start to learn about black food and black food ways and how that relates to like American food. Um, I always start them with that primer. I'm like, what you want to go do is you want to go get high on the hog first. Don't get Thank involved you. with other things because it's a, it's a really great way to like lay it out for people and help them understand that how they're going to probably hear these stories is very similar. I think because we do have some shared experiences across the the diaspora that people tell these food stories in very similar ways. Um, but what was interesting to me was it was like, the book isn't that old. It's about a decade old now. Well, and... yeah, it's been a decade, <laughs> a long, well, particularly right through now. And well, in, um, in the sense of um, just, you know, how fast the food world has moved. Yeah. So that a decade is eons, eons, absolute eons, because there's, there's so much there. Oh, absolutely. And I, cause it was, it feels, I think at some point it just felt like it was a book that was a lot older, I think, because the stories have so much resonance. It kind of just keeps echoing through history until someone puts them on paper and puts them out there. So the, the energy of it feels very like, Okay, this has been a, these sto- this story has been around a very long time. Um, so the published part of that, the publishing part of that, is like okay for a book, you know, for I guess for me because I read so much and most of the books I read are much older than that. It's just like ten years doesn't seem like a long time to be in existence as a piece of like published work. Um, and so that was you know I. I connected with that. It was one of those things where I was watching like one of your first interviews when the book was published uh, with um, Cooney. And I remember you talking about how it was really inspired by your grandmothers. And we, you know, that's so common across most people's stories that a lot of times our first connections or relationships with food are because of our grandmothers and like sitting in their kitchens um, or, you know, at their hip, watching them cook or just smells from their kitchens. And so my question is, what was what was one of those first food experiences that kind of imprinted on you that it was like you it was it's continuing to echo in your work and in your life right now? Wow. Well, I guess um, I guess one and I've talked about this before, but one is uh, not so much my grandmother's, but my mother. Mm. I am an only child and my mother actually was a trained dietitian. And so I grew up eating well and eating regularly, but also as an only child, and we're talking about the late 40s, early 50s, um, if she was in the kitchen, I was in the kitchen with her. So she would think about doing something um, something to occupy my time and keep me out of trouble, I guess, and keep me in her, um, in her view. Yeah. And so at some point she must have been baking a pie and was doing something with pie crust. And she gave me a piece of the pie crust and some, I guess it must have been red food coloring because I remember something that was vividly pink and um, and some sugar. And I played away with it and did whatever. And we put it in a, a baking tin or, you know, not a baking tin, but a, a cookie sheet. We put it on a cookie sheet. And put it in the oven with the, with the pie crust, and lo and behold, when it came out, it was as I said, vividly pink <laughs> and sweet. And my mother, ever ever kind, um, ate it, and I ate some of it. <laughs> we we liked it. It wasn't you know, it was pie crust with sugar. How bad was it going to be? So what we did was we decided that it wasn't a cookie, it wasn't a pie, and it wasn't cake. So we called it Kupai Cake. And <laughs> All right. The first book came out in 85, I guess, 85 or 86. I remember writing in my mother's copy, we've come a long way from Kupai Cake. So that was <laughs> my first food thing. I love it. My grandmother used to... Um... She was that person who would put all of our leftovers together and make like one big pot of what she calls stuff my jig. Mm-hmm. And so, so that's like, that reminds me of that is like, we're just going to give it a new name. You know, it right. doesn't, this hasn't existed before and neither has the name. So um, that makes, yeah, that, I, that feels right. Um, the, you know, w- with the book right now becoming a visual, having a visual representation at this point, And how do you, how are you experiencing your own work? 
at the like because the book has had 10 years and you've talked about it of course so much with a variety of different people and it's influenced of course you know most of my peers at this point uh the people who work in food writing and the food historians and anthropologists that we know um how have you experienced your work over the decade and now that it has a new iteration of itself like how are you is it does it feel fresh to you again does it feel like a new experience all over again um there's a whole lot of stuff wound up in there. Um, one is the, uh, have you seen some of it? Oh, I've seen the whole thing. Okay. <laughs> because it's, it's only the first half of the book for story. I... And it is sort of inspired by the book. It doesn't really take the book literally. It's not as right. though people are seeing the path of the trajectory of the narrative. Right. It is the narrative that is used as an inspiration for finding folks of a younger generation who are continuing some of the things that happened. So it's, it's my book, but it's not my book. <laughs> right. Right. You know, so it's, I've been telling people it's almost as though you had a child and gave it for adoption. And, you know, then, you know, you see the child as an adult and you recognize of course that it is your child and you were pleased with how it was adopted because I'm very pleased with how, how they have adapted things and interpreted things, they being Fabien Toback and Karis Jagger, who were the, right. were the sort of force motrice behind the whole thing. But in terms of that, it's, you know, it's, I see, I see them in it as well. Mm. You know? So it, it's, it's a collaborative effort in that, that sense. It, it's more than a specific individual thing. I was, I was listening to your, actually, I was listening to your interview with Elle and um, it had come up that you she, you guys were talking about your education and like your experience at um, Bryn Mawr and then with, with Sarah Lawrence and being in France. And then um, a really interesting nugget that stood out to me was that you were initially, you were, you wanted to be an actress, you wanted to be in theater. Mm -hmm. and, and so now that you've had this opportunity to be in like this first episode and to be on screen and you've, you've spent a lot of time like in the public at this point, like your work has definitely put you kind of front and center in the public eye, um, just not in a theater capacity. Like how has that, has, does that desire kind of still sit with you or have you found another, you know, do you find like the way you're doing your storytelling right now has kind of satisfied or scratched that itch or would you still consider, you know, being casted in a role or, well, I, I mean, there's there's a whole lot of stuff um, that's that's out there that's going on. Um, I have always been told after most of my television performances and, and unsolicitedly told, you're good. You really need to have some space, place where you do this. I am certainly at a point where I'm I'm still open to it. I would, you know, I like very much to be involved in, in things and such, such as that. I've got some ideas that maybe all of this notoriety will allow me to, to get off the starter's block. All right. So we'll, we'll see what, if anything, happens with any of those ideas. But yeah, I, I think that for, well, not even years, for five decades, which would be the 50 years I was teaching, um, you know, acting and teaching are not that dissimilar. Um, I think that good teachers, and I like to think I was a good teacher, have to have some form of performance skill and storytelling skill to engage students. Um, I was teaching freshman English and teaching freshman English basically to the world for five decades. So I needed to have some storytelling skills to to keep me interested, but also to keep them interested. Right. So that, uh, you know, eventually I started teaching English um, because it really is about getting students to write and what are students going to write on? What do students have in common? And how did that morph over five decades? And that's a whole nother conversation. But <laughs> the upshot was toward about the, the third decade or the middle of the third decade going into the fourth decade, I decided that everybody's an expert on food. So why not write about food? So I had my right. students write and read about food. And then that made a big difference because 
First of all, you talk about claiming yourself and having some degree of expertise. Students were delighted. I mean, because I was teaching in the SEEK program at Queens College, which is part of CUNY in New York City, the City University of New York. And so what happened was um, the student population changed. It went from being essentially Black and Hispanic, when Hispanic meant basically Puerto Rican or Dominican, to becoming really a version of We Are the World. But the program morphed and became almost 43% Chinese. And so that's a big that's a big swing in terms of all sorts of things. Oh, yeah. And so I'm kind of like uh, Gilbert and Sullivan, you know, make the punishment fit the crime. I want the uh, <laughs> I wanted the the work that we were discussing to reflect the students. And so when when I started talking about food and when I started teaching about food, it was fun because then we could find food narratives out of everybody's culture because everybody's got them. And so they would read a variety of different things that were all about food, and it, it made it it made it nice. It wasn't just me sort of crunching my food and my food journey on them. It was about using food to find that kind of lingua franca that we could all speak. Right. You know, if right. we talked about rice, the Chinese students got it, but the Hispanic students got it because they got it through rice and beans, and you know, the African American. So it really worked quite well. Wow. Well, and, and speaking of um, just being able to tell your story from your own point of view, the I understand that you're a linguist, and I noticed that you <laughs> speak of, that you you just it, hearing you speak uh, in the in the docu series was really interesting because it was like you kind of flow in and out of all of these different languages so with such ease. And I have spent a greater part of my adulthood trying to just um, get my French together. Uh, so. <laughs> I was like, one of these days we're going to do this right. Um, how has like having that language um, skill influenced how you talk about food and how you write about food? Well, I don't know that it influences how I talk about it and how I write about it, but I think it does perhaps influence how I research it. Because one of the things, and it goes back to the performance, I am a mimic. I usually get ac- accent and intonation right. Okay. I may only have four words, but after I've given you my four words, you usually think I know more than I do. <laughs> so it's been pretty amazing. I mean, in 2019, I was invited to go to China. And I had, and I don't think I can, I can't do it now, but I had a translator who was with me 24-7, and she was a lovely young lady. And we talked, I, I explained the story of High on the Hog that's in the book. At the beginning of each lecture, she would tell that story in Chinese. And of course, pigs are very important in Chinese diets, so that um, they totally got it. Then on top of it all, I was in China in, I guess, late February, March of 2019. So it was just the beginning of the year of the pig. (laughs) It's so true. Yeah. at the end of her thing, I would always say, and may we all live high on the hog in the year of the pig. I but love it. what she had taught me how to say in Chinese was, you know, good evening. I am very pleased to be here. And it was, I can't remember exactly. And I'll probably say something awful. And so best <laughs> not put that out over the air. But um but I remember that people would sit sit up a different way and sort of look at the, oh. And I think it's two things with languages. I think it's, it's first of all, the, the desire to speak someone else's language. There is a point in the first episode where I simply ask, how do you say thank you? Yes, I, that was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I kind of sat with that moment for, for a little while, too. And it, it made me think, whoa, you know. How 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 have I gone this long and not known how to say thank you, you know? So I mean, and part of part of that certainly the answer in terms certainly of the first episode is because I went that long. I was saying it in French. I wasn't saying it in fond because that's thank you in fond as opposed to uh, aduque, which I do know, which would be thank you in Yoruba. Okay. So. Um, but awanukaka, I will always remember. And I may not be able to say anything else, but I can say awanukaka. And I think I repeated it at another point, even mm-hmm. in 
that that vignette in the show. So, I mean, it's things like that that have helped my research because those are the things that make the connection. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that moment was, it's funny because I found myself repeating it as well as it kind of showed up in conversation. And I sat with, like I said, I sat with that moment for a while because the idea of asking someone how to speak to them and it was always, you know, kind of reminded me of these moments where my mother used to tell us, you know, you teach people how to treat you or, you know, that idea of like developing relationship with people and understanding their language. Because even if you both speak English, you your life experiences and how you walk through life means you've kind of created your own language for yourself and how you express yourself. And so I kind of sat with this idea that, you know, to just simply ask someone, well, how do I say thank you? Like, how do I speak to you to show you gratitude and respect and how that has kind of started to bleed over, you know, the conversations we're having around like race and things like that in this country. Because I think a a good part of that is like, how do we speak each other's languages? How do I express like care and empathy and respect to you. Um, and, you know, instead of assuming I know how to just be humble a- enough to go and just ask and and place yourself in a position to be receptive and to learn. So I just, I, that again, like I, I kind of sit with those smaller moments that people might not always pay attention to when they're watching something like this, because it is like watching the series. I had to watch it a few times because you just miss things the first few times and you kind of like, okay, I want to look at like the, I want to get the macro experience and then I want to go back and watch like the get those micro moments Mm -hmm. as well and for me that was just something that language was always a big thing in our house my mother wanted to be a linguist when she went to college and so how we talk and what we say just always was like you know drilled into us like what you say matters and how you say it matters and so it was like those moments in the in the series I was always just kind of fixated on because when you're people really kind of only think in their own like native tongue in their heads. And so to step out of that and, you know, put yourself in a vulnerable position to hear someone in their language is um, I just think it's one of those things where we learn empathy and we kind of open ourselves up and get bigger on the inside when we, when we pursue that. So, um, so yeah. So no, I was going to say, I'm not sure that I agree with you and that people think in one language in their heads, because I know that one of the things that happens to me on occasion is I will get involved in something and I'll find out I'm thinking about it in French, although my conversation is in English. And I sometimes get to the point where I can t- I have to tell people, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the word for this in English. I have it in French. Oh, wow. You know, okay. and do you think that happens a lot more if you if you speak in multiple languages in the post? I think, may, the one? I think it may very well, because I think the different languages unlock different things. Mm. I mean, I, I love words. I am an absolute lover of words. But you can play with words differently in French than you can in English. Um, I can I can flirt better in French than I can in English, you know. There yeah. are different degrees of things. For example, in French, to slice is coupé, but to slice the first slice of something is entamé. We don't have a word for that in English. Oh, that's true. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think that that's and it's funny because learn this process of learning French and becoming more fluent. There's been times in my life where I was surrounded by people who spoke it as like their first language. And so I was able to kind of remain more fluent in that way. And I did find myself um, thinking in French a lot more at that point. And so now that I, you know, I'm back to this really trying to learn it. And it's weird to try to learn it in a silo at this point, because you're like, I don't have anybody to speak it with. So it's a little more challenging. Um, Your film comes in. (laughs) That's why I was just like, okay, Tiff, we can do this. No, no. And, Get on Netflix, watch Call My Agent, turn off the subtitles if you can, do all of those things, watch, yeah. uh, what is the one, Lupin? Yeah. Watch all of oh, them, yeah. turn off the subtitles. I've done, I've definitely done a lot of that. I've also turned on the, the French subtitles okay. as I've been watching them too. So I'll watch, like I've watched um, Chef's Table uh, in France and just like left all the English subtitles off and just, just, mm-hmm. just spent time with it and I do like now I am I'm more aware or more mindful of like when I have those moments when I'm thinking in a different language and um that's when you begin to know that you're really speaking it wow okay 
good to know. I will <laughs> keep that in mind. So when I get to a place where I'm just like, I can't do this anymore, I will remember this moment. Um, for because the the series covers about half of the book, and um, you know, I'm hoping that when people watch it, it doesn't just start and end the conversation for them. It just it starts to. I wanted to inspire more questions, and um, you know, spark some curiosity, and for them to kind of chase down the information and go pick up the book and just get the whole story well, at this point. <laughs> for I'm sure, there'd be a second season. So <laughs> that too, the um, the book. Absolutely, and 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 again, like you know, it's funny, like watching things go from being um, just written works to being filmed. So, you know, even big, huge blockbusters like um, Lord of the Rings and that kind of thing. Reading the book, of course, by Tolkien is really different than sitting with the three hours of film. So I still want, I still need people to just go get the book as well, because the experience of reading your work is, you know, in conjunction with watching it or watching something inspired by it, um, I think creates a bigger picture and creates a more holistic picture um, for people because they don't just get the history of the food. They, you know, they get to hear your voice. They get to, you know, kind of engage with you a bit more um, as a writer. And if they get the audio book, they really get to hear my <laughs> voice as I read it. Oh, I love it. And the thing is, you have such a lovely speaking voice. It's like, I wouldn't be mad at that. I, that would be fine. I mean, I would even be like, you know, she could probably do one of these calm app meditations and these like nighttime stories. And I'd be perfectly <laughs> all right with that. So um, Now, I, I will. I'm a pivot real quick because I wanted to revisit this idea of um, you working in theater because my sister's a theater professional. She works with um young black people who want to work in theater at this point, but she spent her entire life on stage. <laughs> she worked and, with old black people. <laughs> and this is the thing. The question. <laughs> we, were, we were talking about you yesterday because I was like kind of thinking about what to talk to you about today. But I wanted to make sure I was bridging you know, creating some layers for people because they're going to come to the series. They're going to watch the series. They're going to know that the, you know, it's inspired by your book. They might go pursue your book and then it's like, okay, so who is she? And so I was more interested in kind of uncovering that information so that they have greater context for what season two might bring us and all these other things. But we were talking about that moment and I was just like, she said something about theater. And of course my sister perked up completely. And the first thing I thought, the first thing I thought about is I wonder if she would ever put her memoir as into a play and you know create a stage play around that and of course my sister's eyes lit up because she understood um what that memoir consisted of and she was like um you tell her if at any point she is interested in doing that i'd love to talk to her and I, that that's kind of led me to this question is like what you know, are there things in your life that you would want to put on stage? Are there plays that you've written that you're, you know, you'd be interested in, like, you know, of course, putting up and, um, and you know, what what's the difference between how you would tell that story there and how you essentially tell your stories just in your written in your written work? Well, I think there's several things. First of all, about the memoir, it, it has been optioned and somebody oh. is actually working on it. Uh, it's about time for the option to renew, so we'll see if they don't I'll be calling you. They'd be crazy if they didn't, but all right. <laughs> <laughs> if they don't, I'll be calling you. But along with that, um, I have not written plays. I mean, you know, the High on the Hog was my first jump into narrative. Remember now, oh. up until then, the previous 11 food-related things were cookbooks. Right, right. So that the cookbooks all encompass, you know, narrative. And that's one of the reasons that High on the Hog got written was because the head notes and the, everything that I could put in before got longer and longer and longer. And, you know, I really, recipe is not my thing. I am an intuitive cook. I cook, you know, by taste and by smell and sometimes by sight. And it's like, mm, that doesn't look right. Let's do something else. You know? <laughs> You're right. You know, so that's how I cook. And I've always threatened to write a cookbook that just has a list of ingredients. And it's like, figure out your proportions. Uh, this should be fried or this should be sauteed or this should be stir fried or this should be baked. And let folks go at it. Because I think we are yes. too bound by the constrictions of recipe. Absolutely. You know, there are people now who, if it says a teaspoon and they've put in a teaspoon and a half, they're worried. 
you know, and there are plenty of people now who who are are worried because yeah. it's it's like it ain't architecture. It's not <laughs> if you move this beam, the house will fall. I mean, right. now, baking, yes, baking is a different thing. Yeah, you know, they it's say like, that uh, cooking is art and baking is science. Science, yep. You know, but um, but with cooking, I always say, you know, if you put together four things you like, you're probably gonna come up with four something you like. Let the people know. <laughs> you know word go forth unto the land. And, you know, play with your food. You know, I mean, yeah. we've gotten so. Oh my it. gosh, it's true. You know. No, I. That's not a professional kitchen. That's a home kitchen. Professional kitchen. You're trying for continuity. I did restaurant reviews enough to know. If I go to a restaurant and I order the same thing four times, I want to get the same thing. Right. You know, so that's very different from at home where it can be a what you call a thingamajig or a yes. pie cake, you know, and it's okay because that's going to taste different every time. But, oh, you know, yes. but so there are all of those distinctions that, that make a difference. All of that being said, I love the idea of doing a theater piece at some point. I would be up to and open for for collaborating with somebody i don't know if i want to do that but yeah well it's it's fun and i I, like back to your point about recipes because when i used to teach cooking classes that was my whole thing i never taught from recipes i always wanted to teach to i've taught people techniques i'm like Mm -hmm. because if you know how to saute you know how to saute if you know how to deep fry you know how to deep fry and i found that to be more useful it's like if you if I can teach you techniques and you go home and you can just apply it to whatever you want to produce and your outcome is what you want, you've gotten more from that than me giving you a set of recipes to for you to live in. And um, it just always felt restrictive. So I am all for seeing cookbooks evolve just a little bit in that way. Mm-hmm. Just as like, can we step outside of like this particular, you know, mm-hmm. type of recipe? Right. Exactly. That kind of narrow, that more narrow view of like how something can be done. Because I know, you know, watching a handful of other documentaries and, you know, the idea of passing on what you eat in a, culturally is it, it, you know, I had to sit in my grandmother's kitchen, just watch what she did. It wasn't like she was going to make announcements about what ingredients were going exactly. and how much was there. Well, that's, that's one of the things that happens with our food. And it's, it's strangely enough, a way that we lose some of our recipes because folks are waiting to write it down. And I keep telling folks, you've got this thing in your hand nine times out of 10 that is called your cell phone that has a camera. If you can't take a note, film it. Right. At exactly. Film it. That way you'll see that little extra thing that happened that is never in the recipe. Exactly. That moment where you're going to go, why does this taste like this? They're like, well, I had a few extra bits mm-hmm. over here in the refrigerator. So I just went ahead and added that. You're yeah, just well, like, this is always in it. I, this is, <laughs> this just lives on this shelf. It goes in that, you know. Exactly. Know. Um, like, like my grandmother was great for, she loved a good quick bread because she loved bread and she just was not interested in spending, you know, 20 minutes needing anything. Mm-hmm. And it was like, can this go into the cast iron skillet? and just be done already. And so watching her, you know, move through that process and it was always like, okay, what is she doing with that now? And how long did she like, you know, Mm -hmm. need that and all of those things. And she, no, that wasn't going to happen for you. So it was one of those things where I just kind of sat there and stayed in her business long enough uh, to learn how. And then like my mother, she has this baked chicken recipe, which she just never remembers. And to this day, I'm like, every time I have chicken now, I go back to that, those, that particular baked chicken recipe that my mom made. And I was just like, I'll call her after I've been to a restaurant or something. And I'm like, mom, you got to Do you remember the baked chicken at all? She's like, Oh girl, no. Uh, you, yeah, I think I put butter and some other, and I'm just like, I have to start to record these things when she's doing them. Um, and to that point, I was, I was thinking through a question this morning and, I noticed that like we're in a, we're kind of in a space where we're being encouraged to do that, you know, to sit with like our elders and sit with, you know, family members and just kind of hit the record button on a cell phone and get those stories. And I was like, and while I love that practice, I've been really thinking about how do we apply that to ourselves in real time? You know, like what, what makes it 
you know, why do we kind of reduce the importance of the stories that are happening to us right now? And, you know, if we're, if we're sitting with a group of our friends, regardless of age or uh, time of life, to hit the record button and capture these conversations that we're having and capture these experiences that we're having in a way that in 150 years, if someone is like, hey, what was life like in 2021? You know, we had enough foresight to record even ourselves because of, you know, how black history has always, especially in the United States, been erased at this point. And we're trying to reinsert these stories back into the, you know, the known history of the country and kind of watching the the push and pull of that. And, you know, to see your to see work inspired by your book just reminded me of like the importance of documenting mm those things and so when you're when you were able to because have you've watched the whole series correct yeah. <laughs> some people don't want to watch themselves and i understand that no, no, no. Um, i've watched it several <laughs> times the whole series but i think and, i think to your point there are two things one is um yes absolutely important to get to the day-to-day -day stuff but two of much higher importance is to get the elders simply because they won't be around Exactly. Your friends hopefully will be around, except, you know, life does play tricks on us all. But yeah. I think that the idea is those folks who are really the repositories of stuff. I mean, uh, Amadou Hampate Ba, a West African historian, said at one point, um, when an old person dies in Africa, it's as though a library is burned. And I think the whole idea is to consider that and to understand the importance of that it's about preserving the library absolutely it's very much different thing from preser preserving the quotidian absolutely absolutely and it's that that or i also believe you know that level of urgency is really what you need to apply here is like okay there's gonna be some urgency and while we are you know like my peer group is kind of the the mid 40 plus peer group at this point, you know, I do have friends that I'm losing to, you know, all types of, you know, illness and other things. So that idea of making sure that those who are still with you, especially like my grandmother just turned 90 on Wednesday and just this idea of like preserving her stories and making sure we're, you know, collecting that and then thinking about, you know, what the lifespan looks like for people in my age group at this point and remembering that, you know, there, there's just the sense of urgency to, make sure stories are captured and preserved. No, absolutely. In a, all of it. Yeah. All of it. Remember yeah. now, when I was, I guess, younger than you, um, it was the AIDS epidemic. Yeah. So it's all about preserving and being mindful. I mean, certainly the pandemic and COVID have, have told us stuff about how fragile life is, but all of the people who were probably had their first gobsmacked moment by death with yeah. the death of Kobe Bryant, um, you know, who are still reeling from that. Um, you know, it, this is a fragile thing. Yeah. You know, this is not a here every day thing. And, you know, assumptions don't need to be made, but some theoretically the elders should be, you know. Yeah. Put them in the head of the line, y'all. <laughs> Put them at the head of the line for yeah. capturing all the wisdom yeah. and nuggets. Yeah, yeah. And jewels. For the, in your experience, because you're in the very first um, installment of very first episode of the series, um, that moment that you and Steven had, you know, kind of just with him being able to completely just kind of be really bear his soul and be really vulnerable about how he was feeling in, um, in that space during that, during the ceremony. And it was just like, you know, very few, you know, not very many of us have had that experience yet. And I was just watching through that. Of course, for me, it was like definitely an emotional moment. And I, I, you were, it, it just felt like you, you knew what to do. And I imagine it's because you've had that moment yourself with yourself and with other people. And so I was curious as to what that moment for you was like the very first time and like, who was the person who like held you? And if you had anybody to do that for you, um, you know, when well, you first had that experience. Ironically, uh, well, let, let me define the experience a little bit. It, it's yeah. something that takes place 
in uh, the sort of site of a mass burial in Ouida in Dahomey. And um, there are places like it up and down the entire coast of Western Africa. And um, so my uh, moment, if you will, came back in, I think it was 1975. I went the first time to Western Africa in 1972, which I like to remind people is before roots. So I was there at a point in time when African-American tourism to the continent was not what it has subsequently become. Mm -hmm. And with that, there was a place, there is still a place called the House of the Slaves, La Maison des Esclaves, on Gore Island. And in 72, I was actually in West Africa with my mother. And she broke down, so I had to be there yeah. for her on that first trip. So it was only the second trip where I kind of had my moment, large quotation marks, yeah, And a wonderful Senegalese lady that I have not seen since. and But I remember her name. And her name was Yaya Mbuk. And she came and she came over to me and she, t she said, you need to be with your people. And mm. at that point in time, there were um, two African-Americans living on Gore Island. Uh, one of them was John Hope Franklin's son. John Franklin, who just retired from the National African American Museum of History and Culture, Museum of African American History and Culture. And so she took me to them. And I ended up spending time with them and forging, you know, friendships that have become lasting friendships. So wow. that was how that one worked. But wow. So that was that. Um, you know, different people have different reactions in different places. Um Cape Coast and Elmina in Ghana are brutal because they are actually dungeons, prisons. Um, the House of the Slaves is so named, but what the name does is kind of take us away from the fact that the entire island of Gore was used that way. Every house was that. And in fact, um, the husband, Suleiman Keita, who was an artist, um, of Elaine Keita, who was the other American, along with John Franklin back there. Um, but uh, Suleiman said as a child, he lived in that house. So it was not always a museum, and it was not always the house of the slaves. At some point, it was simply a house on Gore. Um, but when you think about all of those places, I think one of the places that's most affecting to me is, is Benin. And it's not for that arch. I really am not particularly fond of that arch. Um, mm. I think the arch, I can't say trivializes, but diminishes it. It's the vastness of the ocean that does mm. it for me. It's when you just see that space, and it's ultimately part of that last scene. It's where you see that space that just looks out onto the horizon. And there's nothing there but the horizon until mm. you get to the other side. And to think about that, to think about what that must have meant and what the terror of that must have been is, is hard to, to even fathom, literally fathom. We can't fathom, get to yeah. the depths of that. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it does. And it felt it you know, it definitely feels like it, it breaks you, it breaks you open and starts you anew mm -hmm. heading into a specific space. Like there is definitely a before and an after, but the after enlarges you um, if you let it. And so like, I definitely felt bigger on the inside, just watching it, just being mm -hmm. able to experience it in, you know, in the, you know, from the, the screen from a little small screen in my room. So I can only imagine like if it sits in you, for long enough, it should, you know, you should, I, I imagine you feel a little bit bigger. You feel like you can, you know, you encompass more space in the world, which has been, you know, one of those 
is like an opposite experience when you're in the United States and you grow up as a black person in this country, you do feel like you're, you're diminished in a way and that your life is compressed and you take, you are only allowed to take up so much space here. And so to have that moment um, captured on camera where it just feels like it breaks you open and allows you to take up more space in the world um, for me was that, that really like still sits with me and still resonates with me. So it was, it was nice. It was really a blessing to be able to get that on camera and because it feels like a very intimate and sacred moment as well. So it's almost like I used to, as a kid going to church, it was always very, I always felt a little uncomfortable watching people in like worship or prayer because I felt it was such an intimate moment for them mm -hmm. that I was looking in on something that was really just not my business to look well, into. Was personal. Yeah, no, yeah, very. It's so deeply personal. And so I, part of me felt that way too, watching it was like, oh, I want to, you just like let people have that space to, you know, to process and be with that, but also, you know, like the, just have courage to share it and let people know, like, cause we, we always get people captured on film going to like the Holocaust museum and like visiting those types of spaces all the time. They get captured on camera a lot. And so to be able to capture like that moment, you know, culturally for us as well, I, it was really important. But like I said, it always, it also felt like really personal and well, almost like, should we be watching this? <laughs> well, I think it's. I think it was personal, but I. Th I think also that it, it. It. As the moment. Is the moment. Yeah. On camera, I think it's about survival, and that's the point that was, I hope, being made. Is just yeah. out of all of that. Out of all of that, basically came us yeah oh yeah and that's that's the point and that's that's specifically the thing that i would hope african americans take away because so many, so often we don't want to talk about enslavement because it feels diminishing and it feels belittling and it feels being less than and i have always been of the mind that it it has created an incredible sense of power and um you know just the survival the ability to survive is extraordinary Absolutely. is extraordinary and we never give ourselves or more importantly we never give our ancestors or rarely give i don't like to use the word never we rarely give our ancestors full credit credit for what they did for us to be here Absolutely. Absolutely. The fact that we are here because they survived mm -hmm. is always like something to um, always that just you keep it. This I keep it the center or the front of my mind for sure. Um, and now I w I'm going to give you one last, well, two last questions, but they're essentially connected. First, you know, watching the series overall, what you get is a tremendous sense of just joy, like just really profound joy and community um, watching it, even with like those moments where you do have to connect with some of the, the, the darker spaces. It's just the overarching um, spirit of it just felt really joyous and celebratory. And so my two questions would be one, what is bringing you joy right now in your life? Um, and then the second part of that question is to what are you pursuing right now? What are you curious about? Who are you excited to just read? And, you know, what voices are in the literary space at this point that you're just excited to, to see? And um, what kind of stories are you starting to see emerge that you're really excited to, um, to start to promote and pay attention to and maybe even seek, sink, sink your own teeth into at this point? Wow. And okay, um, first one, I think certainly just the fact that the story is getting told is is bringing me vast amounts of joy. I am clearly this is a moment, and I am savoring the moment. I am you know honored, delighted, over the moon, thrilled to be a part of the moment um wish that, and this is where I always tear up, but wish that some of my people, you know, yeah. were around to have the moment, you know, to enjoy the moment, to just know that the moment is here. Um, that's, that's the bittersweet, but, you know, as, as one ages, one begins to understand that word a great deal. 
bittersweet. You know, it's not always just sweet. And I don't like too sweet. We all, you need a little bit of the bitter so you can appreciate the sweet. Absolutely. Um, but that would be, that would be the thing that in the absolute immediate is bringing me, you know, joy. Um, and it's going to debut, you know, very shortly. <laughs> exactly. yeah, I'm like, well, this is going to get real interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm curious about reviews. It'll be interesting to see what people think and how yeah. people think. The people that I've spoken with thus far have been very complimentary, but we'll, you know, in the immortal words of Napoleon's mother, pourvu que ça dure, which roughly translated means, please God, let it last. <laughs> um, so there's that. I think in terms of what I'm doing, I am working on a book. I'm working on a book, have sold the book after that, and have an idea in my head for the book after that that I All right. really <laughs> want to do. So I'm working on a book that basically is called Braided Heritage that's about the um, some of the foundational cuisines of American food that is in the United States in term. Okay. Um, I've sold a book that's going to be about about my family and African American food history as my family reflects it. Um, and the third idea, I'm not going to tell anybody about. <laughs> Fair, good. <laughs> well, I just it's it's you know for me it felt like this becoming you know a visual experience. Of course, just felt like okay you know, we just getting started. I mean, Dr. Harris is just getting started. She probably got all types of gems and, and jewels for us, you know, in the, in the next decade or so. I, do. Um, so, I, like, so yeah. I like to think I do. I mean, there's my, my agent jokingly says, girl, you having a retirement Renaissance. <laughs> and, and ultimately the bottom line is, you know, for 50 years up until 2018, my passport said professor. Wow. So all of this, all of those 12 books and the 12 books on food and all the rest of it was what, you know, what folks now call my side hustle. That was not my profession. Right. I have really only had two years of being able to apply myself to this fully. I love it. I don't think it's bad for two years. No, no. I mean, look, uh, <laughs> I was like, I'm looking at the last of two years of my life. Like, Ooh, I have not put in enough work. Uh, <laughs> I need to do a little bit more, uh, for a, a last bit, like a, a word of wisdom for people. Uh, I'll ask you for in not so much how to like find their purpose and all that business. There's plenty of books and knowledge and wisdom out there about that. But to your point about like the work you're doing now was your side hustle for a long time and just some wisdom on that kind of pivot where you've spent that much time invested in doing something else and now you're at the beginning essentially of doing this and you know people will look at their life they'll look at their timeline they'll look at like how much life they have left to live and you know what their age is and their, you know their station in life at this point and like what do you say to people when they're hesitant to just like move into a different space and, you know, not pursue something because they believe that those things are limiting and opposed to, you know, I think right now is a perfect time to write anything because you have the the life experience and the the language for it. And, you know, when someone writes a book when they're young, not to take away from that, but, you know, the life experience is limited and their understanding of people and the world is a little limited at that point because they've only lived so much life. But as you get older and the world unfolds a little bit more and you take risks and you have bigger relationships and stuff like that, you do have a little bit more to offer in that space. So like, what would your advice be for, especially everyone's trying to pivot, you know, last year in the pandemic, everyone learned like, oh, I necessarily don't have to do the work I've been doing mm -hmm. and maybe that work doesn't exist anymore and I have to find something new to apply myself to. So what do you say to people when they just feel like, oh, there's too much there for me to make this shift and I just, I don't think that's going to be the best thing for me to do. Well, I think there, there are two things. Um, the first thing would be look for and find joy. What is it that you enjoy doing? I mean, Maya Angelou used to sign her books simply joy mm. and then her name. Um, I think find joy may be more of a focus 
way of, of saying that same thing. So look for and find joy, um, whatever mm. it is. And I mean, and that's a sort of a daily thing. I'm not sure I'm always doing it, but I'm always trying to. So I think there's that. And then I guess the last thing would be, don't make it a pivot, make it a pirouette. Ooh, okay. That's a, yeah, we're going to just take that and run with that for the rest of the year. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to need that myself probably in a couple of months. Um, well, thank you. I mean, I will, I just watching the series brought me definitely a profound sense of like joy and connection and then watching and reading everyone, you know, most of the people who have written about it at this point, like um, Osai and, and a lot of the other like food writers in the space, like I've gotten acquainted with over the last few years. And so it's been, it's, really such a pleasure to see them become, you know, find more even deeper meaning in their own work because of it. And then of course, you know, knowing that doing this work in community and having like your own tribe to kind of do this work in is so essential. And like knowing that, you know, a lot of your tribe is not here physically anymore, but definitely well, with us in spirit. <laughs> actually, the bottom, bottom line is I didn't have a tribe. I think the mm. whole notion of having a tribe is something that your age group and below are blessed with in terms of food. There was no tribe. Certainly there was no African-American tribe. People were were around. I was around at the same time as Verda May. I was around at the same time as Edna Lewis, but I don't know that Verda May talked to Edna Lewis. I certainly was in the presence of both of them, but, you know, mm. um, probably a lot friendlier with Verda May. I can't say that because I knew Edna Lewis, but she was always, to me, an elder. Mm. So, um, you know, Verda May was an elder, but more of my contemporary. So that, you know, but we weren't a tribe. I mm, mean, I think the true. idea of a tribe implies support and uh, conversation and, you know, discussion and, and communion almost. Um, that didn't happen. So you are gotcha. very fortunate in the ability that there are now enough people so that people can find their people. Yeah, you know. absolutely. Well, I mean, you're always invited to be, you know, to be a part of our our people and our tribe for sure. <laughs> You've definitely informed so much of our work that we would be happy to have you at any time, of course. Well, um, but, remember well, and call. That's all. Yes, <laughs> yes ma'am. You look because I, I am that person who would call and be like dropping emails, like, "Hey, how you doing?" I just no, want to check in on you. People do. I talked with uh, Gabrielle Etienne yesterday. I talked with. Um, Makale Faber. I don't know if you know Makale, but I talked with Makale. We're going to have dinner. I, you know, I talk with a, I, a lot of people I talk to, you know. Um, Wonderful. You know, and so I, 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 I take, you know, some pride in, in the folks and the kids. All right. All right. And they call me. Yes, ma'am. Good. Well, I'm glad because I have, I give this same speech to my siblings when they don't call my grandmother. I'm like, I need y'all to call people. You know, you know, don't act like they it's, it's don't, don't act like they've been out there. <laughs> it's important to, you know, for people to know that they're that they are around. Absolutely. Well, thank you again. Um, I won't take up any more of your day, uh, but yeah. I appreciate you, you know, spending we are some time. Actually with you. on on target and on the money. Here's the funny thing is uh, I referenced being invited to China. The gentleman who invited me to China, his name is Michael Rosenberg. Um they're doing a documentary on Chinese TV about him. Oh, wow. And so, and for some reason, totally known to him because he, we found each other through the internet. Uh, he actually, he reached out to me and said, you know, I am interested in learning about African-American food. Um, you know, can you help me? He said, I've got your book and I'm loving it, but I'm not. And I wrote back and said, well, I can help you a little bit, but your best bet would be to find an African-American church and go speak with the congregation. Oh, absolutely. To which he replied, I'd love to, but I'm in Hong Kong. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, let's, okay. <laughs> let's think of some other things. <laughs> Maybe one day you'll invite me to China. And... 
less than six months after that, he wrote back and said, well, I'm, I'm writing to invite you, please. I, I would love for you to come. And so he is, he's been a chef. He was a chef at the American embassy in China. Wow. You know, and um, he's no longer that. He's got a restaurant in Canton, but an American guy. Um, the interesting thing about it is, to bring it back to an ending on African-American food, my first meal in China was okra and barbecue. Ooh, nice. It was okra sort of blanched and steamed in a sort of soy, not really a vinaigrette, but a soy dressing kind of thing. And then it was barbecued duck. Ooh. But so it had African-American resonance all the way in Beijing. Oh, I love it. You know, I was told people, like, African-Americans are, are, are global people. So don't be, don't be surprised when you find us in places. Well, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> Africans, Africans certainly in diaspora, we are all over the place. We're all over the place. 